Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I uh, hope you guys are doing well, everybody. Okay, Alhamdulillah, thank you to Sister Masura for inviting me as a moderator for today's lot. Okay, uh, I am Sister Khairi Abraza, uh, clinical psychologist in Counseling and Career Services Center. So uh, today I will moderate uh, the forum. Okay, uh, we have a uh, very prominent speakers with us, panelists. Okay, um, actually I'm quite nervous lah, so uh, because uh, semua hebat hebat ya untuk hari ini. And of course, Dr. Alizi is uh, was my former lecturer dulu. Uh, lagi lah kita nervous ni kan. <laughs> okay, so um, okay, Alhamdulillah, I think. Um, Saya, uh, I, I don't want to uh, introduce much about the panelists. Okay, we have Dr. Khadija from uh, Kusim, we have Puan Anita from Miasa, Dr. Alizi as our uh, upper organizational uh, psychologist. Um, currently, he is a uh, freelance, right, Dr. Yes. Freelance, okay. So, and then we have Dr. Abdul Latif, uh, yang memang dia biasa, uh, always with us. Uh, daripada beberapa from the past, uh, our Grand Mental Health One program, Dr. Ablatif uh, uh, was with us. Okay, and uh, actually I will pass uh, to all the panelists to introduce themselves, to talk more about themselves. Uh, I think it's better like that. Uh, so, boleh, tak, boleh lah cerita dengan lebih uh, apa, clear and jelas. Okay, so uh, firstly, I would like to invite okay, Dr. Khadijah to, to introduce yourself and talk about yourself. Okay. Okay. okay, thank you very much Khairia. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, I'm Khadijah Hassanah, Abang Abdullah. Um, uh, I'm a, a medical lecturer and also a psychiatrist from University Science Islam Malaysia. Um, thank you to the organizer um, for inviting me and I'm actually replacing Dr. Ahmad Nabil. Yeah. So for Dr. Ahmad Nabil's fans and those who want to listen to him, I'm sorry that he's not here. Uh, he's unwell, but uh, he's, he has asked me to take his place for today. All right. So um, uh, I'm practicing in Hospital Ampang and also Klinik Pakar Kesihatan Usim in Nilai. Uh, I'm also an active member of an NGO called Green Crescent Malaysia. It's an NGO that uh, promotes awareness about addiction. Um, especially among the youth. Yeah? And uh, we also have a collaboration with the Majlis Belia Malaysia, uh, Faculty of um, Medicine, uh, USIM, and also uh, Esports Darul Khusus under the name of Esports Medica. So we're actively promoting healthy gaming yeah, among youth. Um, and my other research interests include the LGBT community and uh, also postnatal mothers. So I think wow. that's it. Salam perkenalan, everybody. Interesting. Okay. Uh, uh, first, uh, UIA post current IUM, we are given the task to actually work with LGBT community as well to help them. So very interesting to, to listen from you, Doctor. Okay. So uh, next, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Alizi to, to share uh, about yourself to the audience. Assalamualaikum. Thank you so much, Sister Haria, who is my former student and a very good student at that. <laughs> Uh, I was a graduate of IUM with a double degree, bachelor in IRKH and also bachelor of human science psychology. Dr. Latif is actually my former classmates and roommates. And then I also worked at IUM for uh, more than 20 years. And of course, uh, 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 same kuliah with uh, Dr. Abdul Latif. And uh, I, I'm, uh, I, I also had worked at... Uh, Medic Aji Holdings, which is Anur uh, Specialist Hospital. Uh, but now I'm a freelance uh, consultant organizational uh, psychologist. Uh, of course, uh, I hope to meet the other two panelists, Dr. Khadija and Madam Anita, in future face to face, uh, inshallah. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, I'm living at Nilai, so dekat dengan Usim. Maybe jumpa Dr. Oh. Khadija and Mr. Ron. Uh, and uh, other than that, uh, yeah, I, I, I married with five children. Yes, that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Doctor. So we would like to listen from Doctor also in the aspect of industry organizational psychology. Okay. Uh, so uh, after uh, okay, uh, now I would like to invite Puan Anita to uh, Madam Anita to introduce yourself. 
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Sister Karia. Uh, Assalamualaikum to all the panelists. Um, truly humbled, very happy, very honored to be part of this uh, symposium. Uh, I am the president and founder of Miasa, which is the Mental Illness Awareness and Support Association. So I come in today as a person with lived experience, a person with psychosocial disability. So uh, in Miasa, the majority of us are people with the condition. We provide a lot of awareness. What we try to do is strive um, to talk about the importance of taking care of your mental health. Uh, we address uh, many misconceptions on mental health condition, on psychosocial disability, and we provide a lot of support um, particularly um, non-medical um, alternatives um, for people with uh, the condition. Um, and also another thing is I'm very happy to be part of this um, effort because I'm a former student of IAUM as well. Um, I did my master's uh, in Islamic banking and finance uh, many, many years ago. Um, so I'm very happy. I have a lot of uh, respect for all the professors, all the lecturers, all the staff members and students of IUM. So I'm very happy to be here. Hopefully, uh, there will be beneficial takeaways. Mm -hmm. Okay. Madam Anita, also alumni from IUM. Okay. So next, uh, our uh, 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 what, uh, Dr. Nate Abdul Latif, uh, I would like to invite him to uh, introduce himself. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursaleen, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in, rabbi shrah li sadri, wa yasri li amri, wa ahlul uqdatan min lisani yafahu qawli, subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma'allamtana, innaka anta al-alimul hakim, wa la hawla wa la quwata illa billahi al-alil azim, amma ba'd. Bahayikum bitahayati al-Islam, salamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, uh, thanks for for our VIPs, our guests. You know, please consider me as uh, as a host also. So uh, post uh, the question a lot to them because I, <laughs> uh, you uh, the students are always already listening to uh, to my talk. Inshallah, uh, so give chance more to Dr. Arizi. You know, with a lot of knowledge. Is Dr. Anita with experience? Is Khadija also with experience and knowledge? Alhamdulillah, I will support, you know, I just add to become, uh, edit, uh, just add a few values maybe, inshallah. Um, uh, you know, uh, I'm with, with, with Dr. Alizi before, uh, the only thing that I don't uh, f uh, do a double degree, you know, I, my bachelor is fake and also fake, uh, minoring in psychology, uh, so, so I combine now fake and psychology, alhamdulillah. Uh, I uh, introduced uh, a school of therapy uh, by the name of IRT, uh, Iman Restoration Therapy, the meaning that uh, the therapy that is based on, on Iman. Although I am not uh, going to the field, but I, I uh, mostly I, I give lectures and trains uh, counselors and uh, doctors and also nurse, for example, those uh, in, in medical fields and our frontliners, inshallah. That's maybe my little contributions to the to the people. Thank you. Okay, thank you to all panelists for uh, introducing yourself. Alhamdulillah, very, very uh, incredible. Very, very, uh, kata apa, uh, hebat, yeah? very great uh, speakers, panelists that we have for today. Alhamdulillah. Okay, so before we go further for uh, uh, the questions for, for each speaker, I would like to ask uh, one question, uh, uh, general question to all, is about the introduction, brief introduction, and understanding about today's topic, what we want to discuss. Uh, because we we have uh, uh, speakers and panelists from different background, so I believe that uh, each of the speaker and or panelists have their own uh, point of view in terms of uh, uh, introduction and also a general understanding about the topic. So I would like to invite Dr. Khadija to give your brief introduction. This is the idea. So basically, um, mental illness or mental disorder is just like any other illnesses. So when you become ill, uh, you need to get treated. Okay, But because of the stigma that is attached to mental illness, uh, some may have reservations about getting treatment. 
Yeah. Stigma is basically a negative label uh, that people give to a certain group of people, especially people with mental illness. So they are labeled as um, sometimes crazy, uh, lazy, aggressive, yeah, tak kuat iman, and many others. Yeah, so these labels uh, deter people from seeking help, uh, as many do not see themselves fitting these labels. Yeah. So when uh, people do not get help early, yeah, they might experience an overwhelming emotions, uh, or sometimes uh, some people become uh, emotionless or numb. Yeah, uh, and this can lead to self harm and even suicidal thoughts. So uh, self harm is basically deliberately hurting oneself uh, with many self perceived benefits. Yeah, for example, uh, to relieve stress or relieve the pain. Yeah, some people wants to feel the pain because they feel so numb, uh, and some wants to get the attention and many other reasons. Okay, and when a person yeah feels that they have no more hope of living no purpose to keep on going. Uh, sometimes they feel that um, death yeah, is a better option uh, and hence they resort to suicide. So uh, when we say suicidal ideation or suicidal thoughts, yeah, it uh, means that the person is thinking about considering uh, or even planning a suicide. So um, suicidal ideation and also attempt yeah, are strong predictors of future suicide attempts uh, and suicide death. So, um, and it can lead to adverse uh, economic and also health impact implication. Yeah, so I think, um, and I believe uh, that this topic is very important to be discussed yeah, to create awareness and understanding about self-harm and suicide. Yeah? These are two things that people don't like to talk about, yeah? but it happens and unfortunately, yeah, it's on the rise. So uh, that's my understanding of the uh, topic that we're going to discuss today. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Khadija. Okay. So yeah, it's about stigma. The stigma itself, okay, can actually lead to a person who have a mental disorder to, to have that uh, suicidal ideation and also uh, what a suicidal thought because the stigma, when we see um, for the physical illness, people don't talk. I mean, like, no, no one will uh, say something negative about physical illness. But when it comes to the mental illness, we can see in our society, people still have that stigma. Okay, so the topic, according to Dr. Khadija, this topic is very important uh, to create awareness and to, to actually psycho-educate the, the people, the society about mental illness. Okay, thank you, Dr. Khadija. So we go to Dr. Alizi. Okay. Thank you. Uh, as an introduction, I want to promote my favorite motto, and I know my ex students should know about this. We have to differentiate between general concept and specific operation. And okay. we will be able to do this if we study both Hadith Hawli, the saying of Prophet, which usually uh, contains a lot of concepts, and differentiate it with Hadith Fi'ali, which is the behaviors of the Prophet, where we can see the practical aspects of how prophets do things. So, in general, suicide is a sin in Islam. This is very clear. We have to accept it based on the hadith narrated by Thabit ibn Dhahak, radiallahu anhu, that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Whoever kills himself with something will be punished with it on the day of resurrection." narrated by Al-Bukhari and Al-Muslim. We cannot delete this hadith if, uh, and people might be confused if we don't uh, uh, talk about this. However, we have to remember the fate of a servant in the hereafter is not in our hands. It is in the hands of Allah. And Allah knows better all the factors that lead to the suicidal thought or the suicidal behavior. In the Akhirah, it is part of al ghaibiyat or unseen world. And we human beings are not God. Just leave it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't want students, uh, I mean, sorry, student, masih ingat lecturer lagi, I don't want <laughs> audience to misunderstood that we are promoting suicide. No, okay? So that is the general concept. However, at operational level, it's very, very different. Various hadiths that describe Prophet Muhammad Wasallam's behavior will show us that he is really rahmatan lil alamin or a mercy to all mankind. And all mankind include those uh, with multiple genetic, traumatic, unconscious 
cognitive and environmental factors that trigger the, the, the suicidal thoughts and also suicidal behaviors. And this leads to the theme of our symposium today. Many rosah, many facilitations, many exceptions of people with mental illness. And another, another theme is their internalization of ibadah, including perform, performing tasks at workplace, which is my specialization, is different from people without mental illness. Why? Because there's a difference in mental capacity or what we call in al Mufiqah al-ahliyah. So I hope I, together with the respected panelists here, will be able to explain these specific operations, facilitations, exceptions, ruhsah in this forum. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Very, very uh, specific. Masa teringat kat dalam kelas balik. <laughs> okay. Uh, so ada operational punya definition. Okay. So uh, in general, uh, 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 Dr. Alizi mentioned just now, yes, in Islam, uh, those who committed suicide has been mentioned that they will be punished. But then we come to the uh, more operational uh, level. We can see that uh, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is full of mercy. Uh, uh, his behavior, apa yang dia buat semua, ada, uh, we can explain uh, apa, uh, the way he treat and the way he he what he respond towards certain thing, and then uh, he is full of mercy. And also, uh, uh, Dr. Alizi mentioned about um, the faith of uh, the believers is actually in the hand of Allah. So we have no right to judge. Okay, so we go to uh, uh, Puan Anita, Madam Anita. Um, could you share? Thank you very, thank you very much, Sister Karia. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I would like to take the opportunity to congratulate um, the organizing committee for putting together this um, symposium. Alhamdulillah. Um, I think it's very high time for us to be discussing um, this topic out in the open, especially when we talk about suicidal thoughts, suicidal ideas behaviors, self-harming, um, and especially stigma. And stigma has been an uphill battle um, till today, not only in the context of Malaysia, but globally, really. Um, and of course, when we talk about stigma, a lot of, um, you know, taboo, um, you know, we don't really talk about it uh, out of, you know, fear, shame, um, a lot of times being swept under the carpet. So, I would like to take this opportunity as well to apologize beforehand if you know anything that I would you know share during this uh, whole session may be uncomfortable to hear in some parts. But I hope that we we can all be you know frank and honest in this conversation. I'm still learning. There's a lot of things that I don't know, but of what I know, I am willing to share and provide some you know inputs in hopes that it will benefit um, the rest, inshallah. And um, the soul in of course bringing out this conversation out in the open so that we can do something about it so that people that are struggling uh, with suicidal thoughts ideation behavior self-harming whatever it might be to provide um, a way out hope um, to provide um, shared learning experiences and hopefully we can do things better because as we've seen uh, being silent you know, is not um, the way to go so um, just I just really want to state um, the obvious and facts, you know, where every single year we have close to 800,000 people dying by suicide and it is the second leading cause of death amongst um, the 15 to 29 years old. And um, this obviously shows that suicide is taking, you know, our young ge generation, which is um, a tragedy at so many levels, you know, a child, loss of a child, you know, a spouse, a friend, a colleague, a trauma. Um, to family, loss of economic manpower, productivity to the nation. But the thing about it is we arrive to a very strange situation. You know, the irony of it is this is something that is common in the world today, highly stigmatized, very taboo in society, very shameful. Um, but we don't do enough to understand it and we don't understand it enough. And there are a lot of misconceptions, um, hence a lot of people that battle this continue to struggle, you know, um, alone and, and, and in silence. And, you know, one of the things that we need to realize, um, just a little bit more um, to realize is suicidal thoughts are one, intrusive, two, it is a symptom of a condition, and three, it not only needs to be treated, but the underlying cause of it must be resolved, you know, with alternatives, with solutions, with coping mechanisms, with support. Because really what goes in that state of mind of the person is 
extreme, let me tell you, extreme anguish, agony, emotional pain, excruciating pain, helplessness, hopelessness, you know, so the thought process itself is, is closed you know, in that instance. And it's so painful, you know, the mind is not working clearly because of, you know, no alternatives, you know, no way out, feeling very trapped. And the only reason why I can, you know, articulate or share it um, and provide this insight because I'm a person with lived experience. And so I'm really hoping, you know, with all of you, with all the panels today, you know, we can together provide the solution You, um, with religion, being that hope, you know, being that um, solution and giving people, um, individuals a way out. Um, so this is what I'm hoping through the conversation of bringing spirituality in, in today's conversation, inshallah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Arita. So basically, we want to actually help those who are struggling and those who are actually fighting for, uh, you know, in this battle, uh, we want to actually show them the way out, maybe to guide them. And to help them, inshallah. Okay, thank you, uh, Madam Anita. And then we go uh, to uh, to Dr. Latif. Okay, uh, <clears throat> Alhamdulillah, very detailed uh, about the introduction. <laughs> it's covering everything. Uh, you know, in, in my case, uh, actually, you know, um, because my study is is on anxiety. Uh, I mean, under anxiety also uh, is uh, OCD, obsessive compulsive uh, disorder. So maybe I can uh, share, you know, what are uh, the, the those uh, in the early Muslim scholars? Because this is not a, a new issues. Uh, this issues actually far, far away before uh, it is being discussed. And it, there are many manuscripts, even books, uh, by uh, by Muslim scholars, early Muslim scholars, Al Qayyim, Al Ghazali, Al Razi. They discuss about this, uh, about uh, about solution for this uh, waswasa. We call waswasa. Okay. In Bahasa, we call waswas from the word waswasa. I mean, sharil waswasil khannas from the waswas of the shay, the shaitan. And then, and then my responsibility also uh, to you know because some people they you know you know somehow that they differentiate between between science and religion, the science and religion, as if these two are conf conflicting. So it is good that we we can re reconcile between between just the two. It's supposed not to be in contradiction. It's supposed to be complement to each other. Uh, what's, what's more is that, you know, uh, we are created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah knows best our weaknesses. Allah knows best our solutions. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. There is no power. There is no energy. There is no kudrat except with the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah does not leave us for example, to solve our problem alone. Allah is Rahim. Allah is a Rahman. You know, if a, a good father, a good mother, how could he, he see his children solving the problem alone? He will come and help. And Allah is the most merciful. Allah is the most knowing. And Allah will not leave us alone. And, you know, this is very, this is very important. You know, try to understand uh, positively. Kita tidak dicipta untuk menyelesaikan masalah berseorangan. Kita dicipta untuk menyelesaikan masalah dengan pertolongan Allah. We are not created and designed to solve our problem alone. We are supposed to solve our problem with the help of Allah Subhanahu no? no, Taala. That's supposed to be instilled, especially in the life of the Mus the Muslim. Inshallah, we will see how Islam contributes in solving the issues, Inshallah. Inshallah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Latif. Yeah, somehow uh, we can say that when this person, I mean like individual with mental illness, when they are maybe not cognitively stable or they are not stable, they, they need someone to guide them and to show them that actually we have Allah. We have to compliment. I agree with you that uh, the treatment or the therapy that we have, the intervention, psychological intervention that we have, or even psychiatric treatment, we should actually complement with uh, uh, is, uh, Islamic uh, or spiritual therapy as well. Okay, so thank you. Uh, and then we go to uh, the second question. So this question is uh, for Dr. Khadija. 
Okay, in the perspective of psychiatric, uh, how serious is self-harm behavior and suicidal thought? And uh, because, you know, uh, somehow we can say that uh, people, when we when uh, we have, like, our friend tell us, like, oh, I want to die, we feel like um, maybe the, the reaction, we feel like, oh, it's okay, nothing. We feel nothing or we feel like, oh, not, that's not serious. Mm -hmm. So uh, how actually serious when a person... Uh, started to have uh, the intention or they have the thought of dying or to kill themselves. Yes, all right. mm. So basically, yeah, uh, uh, the basic human needs is to feel uh, protected and to have safety. Okay, so when one person starts harming themselves, yeah, um, so it is definitely a sign that something is wrong. Okay, and it's definitely also a call for help. Yeah. So I think let's look uh, a little bit on the statistics yeah, on how, uh, to understand how serious uh, this problem is. Yeah? Uh, like Puan Anita mentioned already, yeah, um, WHO says yeah, uh, 800,000 people, 800, people die of suicide per year and it's about one person every 40 seconds uh, and it's the second leading cause of death yeah, among 15 to 29. So this is about um, 89, um, sorry, 80 percent of suicide yeah, occurs in the low and also middle income countries. Yeah? And um, according to the data, um, 1.4 percent of all deaths worldwide is due to suicide, and it's, um, it makes uh, to the 18th leading cause yeah, in 2016. But what about uh, in Malaysia? Yeah? Let's look at data in Malaysia. Yeah, a systematic review that was done in uh, published in 2015 showed that uh, six to eight per hundred thousand population per year yeah um, committed suicide yeah and if you compare to the world data world is 10.6 per hundred thousand population per year okay so if I just do a simple calculation yeah with the number of Malaysian population it's about 2600 suicide per year which is about seven suicide per day okay um, and if we look uh, um, to another study, a descriptive uh, study on uh, self-harm, yeah, the rate is 16.6 per 100,000 population. So if I do the same calculation for Malaysia, yeah, uh, it's about 5,428 um, self-harm or attempt suicide per year, uh, which is equivalent to 14 uh, self-harm or attempts per day. Okay. But if you ask yeah, any of the doctors yeah, working in emergency department, I think 14 cases per day yeah, for the whole of Malaysia, that's too little. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So basically, it's, uh, I think it's the tip of the iceberg because not everybody who does self-harm or who attempts suicide will come uh, to the emergency department and get help. Most of uh, those uh, patients or clients uh, who just self-harm, yeah, they suffer in silence. Yeah? So, um, so it is important yeah, for, um, um, for us, yeah, uh, if we see our friends, our colleagues, yeah, our family members who have signs of self-harm or express uh, suicidal thoughts, yeah, uh, to get them uh, to understand that they can get help. Yeah? Uh, and it's important for them to get help uh, so that um, they get the proper assessment and also um, they get treatment early. So that's uh, very important. Yeah, so um, I think that's it from me, Kairia. Okay. Okay, Doctor, uh, another, an another question from me. Okay, uh, so when we say about self-harm behavior and suicidal thought, um, how they are different? I mean, like, because I've heard that uh, those who have self-harm, sometimes they do because they just want to do the self-harm. They don't have intention to kill themselves. So could you explain more about this? Okay. Um, all right. So um, you have these people who do self-harm. Yeah? Sometimes they have a lot of uh, intense emotion. Uh, so they get very overwhelmed. Yeah? So sometimes they uh, do self-harm like banging their head. Yeah? Uh, they cut themselves. They burn themselves. Yeah? Uh, some to relieve the stress, yeah? some because they feel so numb. Yeah? Uh, the intense emotion is too much until they, they cannot feel anything. They feel that they're not alive. They feel uh, the, the common words is rasa kosong. Okay? So um, they want to feel that they're, 
they are alive. So sometimes they do things to hurt themselves so that they feel the pain. Yeah, when they see the blood trickling or when they, they feel the pain, then they, they know that they, they are still alive. Okay, so some people do that, but without the intention to die. So mm -hmm. you will have this um, group of people who does self-harm uh, just as a way of coping, yeah? as a way of coping, as a way of um, uh, dealing with their stress, yeah? uh, but not with the intention to die. Okay, and you have this other group of people who when they do things yeah, to harm themselves is because they want to die. Okay. They try, they try as much as possible, like uh, overdosing themselves, yeah, um, uh, trying to jump, for example, or trying to uh, cut their wrist with the intention to die. Yeah, but um, most of the times, uh, the attempt is not um, uh, completed, yeah, or successful. So um, it becomes uh, just a suicidal attempt, uh, or uh, if they have the idea but they haven't tried it, then it is just suicidal thoughts. Okay, when you have suicidal thoughts, means you have thoughts of wanting to die, and you have ideas of how you want uh, to kill yourself. Okay, um, so it's um, two different groups of people, but then if a person has a lot of um, history of self harming, yes, it is a risk factor for them to, uh, to move into the second group eh, to, to start. Um, uh, thinking about suicide and also attempting uh, suicide. Okay. Okay. Thank you, doctor. So those who have who who maybe only have uh, the uh, those who maybe only did the self harm behavior, they have a tendency to go to the second group, which is to have the suicidal ideation, suicidal thought, or even attempt the suicide. Okay, so a uh, very clear explanation from the doctor, Alhamdulillah. Okay, so we go to the second panelist, Dr. Alizi Alias. Okay, so we, what we can, uh, the, the, the questions related to his specialization. What are the role of industrial organizational psychologists and how they can relate themselves to mental health issues? I mean, like the role, their role in terms of, you know, relating to mental health. Yeah, thank you yes. so much. I like this question very much. People always uh, relate uh, mental illness with clinical psychologists, but very seldom with organizational psychologists. Let me start with another hadith. Uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, a Muslim is a brother of another Muslim, so he should not oppress him, nor should he hand, he, hand him over to an oppressor. Whoever fulfilled the needs of his brother, Allah will fulfill his needs. Whoever brought his Muslim brother out of a discomfort, Allah will bring him out of the discomforts of the day of the resurrection. And whoever cover the aib of a Muslim, Allah will cover his aib on the day of resurrection. Okay, we may usually, when we uh, read this hadith, we may think this hadith only refers to physical or material supports. But we forget that human beings also have cognition, have emotion, and have uh, soul. So now, why not we try to reread this hadith from emotional perspective? What are the lessons? First, we should not be emotionally oppressed or abused person with mental illness. We should fulfill the emotional needs of patients with mental illness. We should brought patient with mental illness out of the, the emotional discomfort. And we should cover uh, the, the emotional aib of patient with mental illness by not having having stigma. So sometimes when we read from psychological perspective, we gain different lessons. So being an IO psychologist, workers with mental health problems are often emotionally oppressed with stigma, often have special needs or adjustments at workplace, and consistently facing internal emotional discomfort even while performing their job excellently. So how can industrial and organizational psychologists or IO psychologists in short, how can we help? We can contribute at three levels of intervention. Number one, primary intervention. Number two, secondary intervention. Number three, uh, tertiary intervention. Also known as prevention, training, and treatment. Prevention is before mental illness happen. Training is when the risks are to be managed 
and treatment is when there are cases of mental illness among workers. At primary intervention, an IO psychologist can help in identifying factors that exist in the organization that can contribute to workers' mental health problems. So we can do such as, number one, using valid tools in hiring process. Number two, redesign the performance evaluation system. Number three, creating mental health friendly organizational structure, climate and culture. Number four, use or redesign machines, equipment, furniture, workspace, offices and work environment that can promote health and safety and prevent illness and accidents. And number five, we can introduce fair policy related to gender, race, aging workers, workers with disability, chronic illness, and mental illness. At secondary intervention level, there are two more, yeah, area. <laughs> IO psychologists can provide training for managers and workers on skills such as managing stress, burnout, workplace bullying, sexual harassment. Number two, using character strengths when facing with problems at workplace. Number three, training leaders to be balanced between performance-oriented and workers-oriented. Number four, building teamwork. Number five, managing work motivation and engagement. And number six, improving interpersonal communication and organizational communication. And lastly, at tertiary level, in tertiary intervention level, an IO psychologist can advise on number one, revising employee compensation and benefit packages. Number two, design return to work program after long medical leave or unpaid leave. And number three, set up effective employee assistance program or EAP. And number four, training how to communicate with workers with mental health problems. As you can see, there are so many things that IO psychologists can do. Thank you. Yes, yes, very, very much. Yeah, uh, but then not everybody are aware of this. You know, it is very important because you see uh, here also in IUM, I believe that the staff also needs, you know, help in terms of um, uh, to, 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 to take care of uh, their well-being and welfare as well. It's very important. We will talk more about this, how actually uh, the acceptance or um, in, in Malaysia about uh, IO, psychologists in the organization. Okay, so we go to uh, next, uh, our pan next panelist, okay, uh, uh, Madam Anita. So as Madam Anita have experienced a lot uh, working with the society and you are the president for the MIASA, okay? How do you think the society view and aware about the seriousness of suicidal thought and self-harm behavior? Maybe um, I think uh, nowadays people, they know about uh, what um, kemurungan or depression. Uh, and when we talk about me uh, mental illness, they always like, um, people uh, keep saying that, oh, they're too murung, lah, too, they're too depressed. Lah. But when in fact, we have so many uh, type of mental illness. And I believe that they don't, don't get the proper knowledge. Uh, or uh, education related to mental health. They may have some, but not kata apa, mencukupi. So what do you think, Puan Anita, Madam Anita? All right. uh, thank you very much, Sister Peria. Um, I think that people are generally aware about suicide and also um, self-harming or uh, mental health in general or psychosocial disability in general. Um, but I think we don't understand it fully. Um, hence, we are quick to label and judge naturally. Uh, because the first thing that crosses our mind when we talk about, you know, a mental health condition um, is always the person is crazy, violent, dangerous, weak-willed, um, you know, we don't lack of, you know, iman, you know, we don't pray, we don't read the Quran, you know, we cannot work, we can, we're not productive, you know, and the list goes on. And um, I think this stems from, you know, public stigma. We don't necessarily have the knowledge or we don't necessarily have interacted with a person with a mental condition, or maybe we have a personal experience um, that is negative, but that in itself means that we don't truly understand, you know, the recovery process, you know, maybe uh, the person didn't go th um, through treatments, et cetera, et cetera. So the first thing that we need, need to understand when we talk about suicide is, um, it's complex and there are a lot of variables that comes with it. And I always say that stigma is um, the true poison of it all. 
because um, it hinders a person from getting the help. You know, people feel embarrassed. Um, they sweep, we sweep things under the carpet. There's a lot of fear. And so it can be seen, I would say, as a clinical risk, right? Because um, the person feels trapped in shame and fear. So it delays the person from getting the treatment, which then threatens the whole uh, recovery process. Because, you know, um, Sister Korea and everyone, when, you know, typically when a suicide tragedy happens you know what is the most common faq in malaysia at least you know in, in malaysia context it's always why and is a person a muslim and then the comment will follow the person has everything you know the person looked fine he's famous she's rich the, the person comes from a good family for with the implication of the question there must be some life event that understandably led to a situation where the person felt that you know, the life, his life or her life wasn't worth living. But really, that is a simplistic way or perspective of suicide. And we need to realize that suicide is actually a, a fa final fatal outcome of an illness. And asking why it could be similar. No, I'm not a doctor, but it could be similar. Um, I've heard a psychiatrist talk about this, where when a person dies of heart attack, for example, although it's, you know, two different organs, Know, heart and the and the brain but you know we're not going to say for example if the person goes for a run or goes you know to the gym or exercises and then suddenly dies of a heart attack you know we're not going to say that that exercise you know directly contributed to the person getting a heart attack right you know we understand automatically that you know it was a result of multiple um, factors and so this is how we have to view suicide as well you know there's a lot of things that we need to learn uh, because of the complexity of it because of the underlying issues you know nobody wakes up in the morning morning and thinks you know i give up i want to die but there's a lot of things as well that we know the facts like you know dr Khadija shared and this is what needs to be fed to the public this is you know, common knowledge, public knowledge that needs to be out there. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, it is something that is intrusive, you know, it is a symptom of a condition, it must be treated. And if we treat it, if we provide alternatives, if we provide a way out, you know, a person can be treated, the suicidal thoughts, ideation, self-harming can go away. The person can recover and lead normal and productive life. So this is why I always say that, you know, stigma is, is that um, poison. And also the other thing that is so uh, unfortunate about stigma is when a person that has the condition internalizes it. That means they believe the public uh, negative perception of society being the truth. And that is when the person suffers and struggles in silence and don't and doesn't get the help and treatment that they need because suicide is preventable and mental health condition a psychosocial disability you know has solutions people can recover from it and this is the message of hope that we really need to um, convey across and you know one of the things that I always think about you know why why do people have that perception and and of course there's a lot of reasons to it right we don't acknowledge media you know reinforces stigma but i do believe that the approach to knowledge that has been ingrained in our society since young is a big contributing factor as well you know um at least for me um in school for example our you know ustas or ustaza or teachers you know instill a lot of fear when it comes to religion and you know of course uh, we're, we're more heavy on i would say hukum or judgment you know sinfulness but we forget to emphasize the other aspect of religion uh, which is guidance you know support prevention and for me a lot of it is forgiveness you know mercy hope and providing that way out and strength really and you know or a lot of what we see at Nyasa, for example, a lot of um, children or teens, youth, you know, having all these big questions and, you know, we're, we're not able to, um, not, not that we're not able to, but we kind of shut them and not allow these questions to flow or having that open conversation. And so what happens is with parents and children is it creates a lot of, I feel, confusion, um, sense of doubt, anxiety and fear amongst children. And, you know, of course, I um, learned this the hard way too, uh, you know, when I was unable to function, you know, seven years ago, and I felt really trapped, I couldn't see a way out and surrendering 100% to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during the time really was what 
um, saved me and provided me that way out um, from extreme, you know, hopelessness and fear and exhaustion. Um, similar to the situation that we're in, I, I feel with the whole pandemic of COVID-19. Um, now, you know, I have more practice. I've gone through it. You know, I, I understand it and it really, you know, helps. And so now that I know better, I can do, I can do better. What, but what, what I'm trying to say here is we, if we continuously emphasize the aspects of, you know, sin and judgment, it really prevents those that, that are in distress in seeking help because they are already in that excruciating pain and, you know, a lot of emotional distress. And then we come in and we talk about, you know, um, Iman, we, we can provide that um, aspect later on. But during that time when the person is in crisis is more of providing that hope you know, positivity, a listening ear. And I think um, all this is so, is so important in uh, helping a person that is going through, um, you know, societal thoughts and ideation because through, you know, a lot of research, you know, a lot of um, work that has been, done, has been done, especially people that have attempted suicide and survived it have said that they never wanted to die in the first place. It was just about ending the pain and they didn't see a way out and no one was there present during the time to help them out. And I think this is such, you know, a big um, eye opener for a lot of us. That is why, you know, at Nyasa, a lot of times what we try to uh, convey is suicide is everyone's business. Uh, it is preventable and we all have, you know, a big role to play in helping those um, that are struggling. And those that attempt suicide, uh, you know, as a way to end their emotional suffering, for example, are in need of emotional guidance. You know, they need support, they need medical counseling, and really not, you know, punishments in that sense. And, um, you know, Ustaz Muhammad Noor, who will be talking tomorrow, recently he shared, you know, one of the uh, verse in Surah al maida verse 32, where, you know, it states that those who make mischief or kills one individual will be recorded as though he has made mischief to and killed all of humanity. But similarly, those who save just one individual will be recorded as though he has saved all of mankind. And this is the work. This is the mission of Miasa. This is what we're trying to do. We're trying to change that mentality and approach, um, you know, of society becoming one that emphasizes guidance in religion, providing support, prevention, hope, and a way out, uh, inshallah. Thank you very much. Okay. okay, thank you. Very, very good. Yeah, we can say that I agreed with you in terms of, you know, when we were in school, okay, uh, the Ustads, uh, you know, always like talking about, you know, this is berdosa, haram, uh, then instead of bercerita tentang how beautiful is Islam, how merciful yes. is Allah, okay? So, yes. some, yeah, we can talk about that, I mean, like, hukum, judgment, uh, apa semua tu, but then, kena balance lah. Uh, uh, betul, betul, jarang because, lah. jarang mm, because Sister Kari, mm. uh. Sorry, because Sister Kyria, you know, a lot of teens that come, you know, to Miasa and when they, they speak about their struggles, I feel that we don't provide that enough. And that is when that si sense of doubt happens and they then study other religions instead yeah. because they don't find that in, in Islam, you know, because there's a lot of fear instilled, you know, in religion, you know, kalau buat salah, masuk neraka, you know, dosa, you know, um, so, so if you think about suicide, you know, of course, we all know this, but this is why they're, they're, they are talking to us. They want to know how to stop that from happening. They want, they want some solutions because it's intrusive, you know, it's a symptom. So they, yeah. they want us as adults. It is a safe space. We should be the safe space for them. So we should be providing guidance, providing that hope, a way out from them, for them. Um, and I think this is a conversation that is not happening enough, um, not only in the, in the you know, Islamic culture or, or Malay culture in, in uh, the Islamic world, but also in other religions as well. Yeah. Mm -mm. Okay, okay, thank you, Madam Anita. Maybe we can, we can ask this uh, to uh, upper Dr. Latif, okay? Uh, about this, you know, um, yeah, the, the trend of some ustad that 
keep mentioning about, you know, uh, the sin. Uh, if you do this, you will go to hell. Uh, Allah will hit you. Everything is not instead of um, to remind to the people about how merciful is Allah, how beautiful is Islam, and the way they approach. Also, somehow it can also affect uh, the individual itself. So how actually Islam, you know, um, how suppose actually we, uh, uh, what we call, um, reach out the people according to Islam. Yang betul-betul lah, because, because yelah, ustaz ke apa ke, we are human being after all, ada juga buat salah dan silap. But then how is actually Islam tu sendiri macam mana? Cara untuk kita, uh, reach out uh, the people who need our help. Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <coughs> uh, uh, number one uh, is uh, uh, don't generalize. <laughs> uh, not all, uh, what they call this, uh, not, uh, not, uh, rule, not every rule fixed uh, to all, to what they call these uh, things. Uh, that's very important. <coughs> you know, uh, you know, uh, when we talk about this hukum, for example, halal and haram, for example. You know, we are not talking for those who are coming to us and help, please help me, please help me. Okay, what are you doing? Uh, I'm, I have thinking of committing suicide, suicide and haram, you will, go, you will be thrown into the hell. No, that's, that's not the, the, the way. But now I, I want to talk to what I call this, to the audience now. You know, this is like somehow like preventive measures. You know, you know uh, recently, recently when the government decided to continue with PKPB, you know, some people, they are suffering. So they said what? You know, if I have no religion, I will go and rob the bank. You know, yeah. You know, you, you see how, how, how the important religion is. You know, uh, you know, if, uh, you know, for those who have, let's say, for example, this uh, uh, pap, uh, monkey love, monkey love, monkey love. Puppy love. Puppy love. Puppy love, not monkey love. <laughs> Puppy <laughs> love, you know, it, yeah, because what? Because, uh, you know, we live because of, we, because of meaning. You know, once you give your meaning to others, what does it mean? You lost your meaning. So what is the purpose of life? And then one person say, if I don't have, if I don't have religion, I will commit suicide. See how the, how the role of religion. Yes. So what religion is doing? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, our behaviors, our behaviors are controlled by two creatures. Our behaviors are controlled by two creatures. Number one, we call pleasure. Number two, we call pain. Mm. These two Pain and pleasure are the two creatures that control our behavior. Why people like doing something? Because there is pleasure. Why people stop doing something? Because there is pain. Mm -hmm. There is there is pain. And Allah knows best. Allah knows best. Allah gives the ultimate pain for those who want to do this and that. Why? Because to stop us from doing the, the things. But of course, when, when you come, when, when you are not in your control, you know, don't, don't, don't tell this to them. And they need, for example, support. They need, for example, help. But now, let's say, for example, the audience now, you know, uh, who knows? We cannot guarantee that we are one of the victims of this, uh, what they call this, waswasa. Nobody can guarantee. You know, you know, when I see people, you know, talking about, 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 having uh, what they call this murder, for example, the, the issue recently and the, the, the one, the friend who killed the, another friend, for example. So I, I said, is it possible to happen to us? Possible. If you, if you want to understand people, you better put yourself in the shoes. It might be that you are worse than her, for example. Mm -mm. Because we are in that, not in that situation. We are not yeah. in, that, in that situation. But now, when people are rational, uh, the audience, hopefully they are rational, we have to tell them, they have to tell them, this, what, 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 what is the hukum of this? What? To stop them. You know, because people, whether people, they become, they take their attention, attracted to something, there are two, two ways. Number one, they are more 
affected with something that they want to run away. So we tell them the hell. So they, they you know, they focus on that. But some people they don't want to tell. They, they are not affected by the thing that they run. They don't want to run to run away. I am. I am. I want to know more about about good things. I am attracted to more good things. So this towards two. So different people have different style. Don't general. Don't generalize. You know that's why we, when we talk, the some audience say hey, boring. Some audience say interesting because different person personality. So don't general generalize. Don't generalize. But Islam tell very clearly, those who commit suicide, you know, will be forever in the hell. Forever oh. in the hell. If forever, uh, forever in the hell, you know, haram jannah. Not, not forever in the hell. You mean Allah say, uh, the hadith say, haram jannah. Haram jannah means forever in the, in the hell. So this is, this is the ultimate pain for those who are, who are, who are here now. You know, let's say for example, if something happened to you, tribulation happened to you, you must remember this. Uh, there is no short shortcut. That's not one thing. And another thing is that in Islam is saddu zara'i, preventive measures. Preventive measures. You know, when uh, when suicide is haram, suicide is haram, it is like zina. Zina is haram. Wala taqrabu zina. But the Quran does not say, don't commit zina. The Quran say, don't approach to zina. Zina. Uh, no, the, because what? Because this suicide is haram, but anything that leads to suicide also is haram. Uh, that's a, 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 a qiyas based on that uh, ayah, you know. Anything that leads to zina, haram. Anything le that leads to uh, suicide also ha haram, including having these thoughts, for example, suicide, suicidal thoughts, for example. Uh, that's, uh, and then, you know, uh, how 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 danger it is we must understand this you know everything start with with khatir 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 the plural the plural is khawatir we call in english inner fleeting thoughts inner fleeting thoughts that comes into our mind mali jangan khawatir ha, jangan khawatir actually khatir lintasan lintasan that come into our mind and this lintasan lintasan is divided into two one is good from Allah, ilham. One from shaitan, you know, persuasion and whispers we call waswasa. And when it comes to our mind, from khatir, it leads to a raghbah. A raghbah means a wish, wishful. And then this motive becomes stronger, it becomes azam. Azam means determination. We need that the motive grows strong, stronger. Azam leads to intention. Now it has intention. And intention normally followed by act, action. You see how, how, danger, danger, uh, how dangerous it is, you know, because what? Because it comes from ha khatir. It's careful with this waswasa, you know, it starts with wa, wa, wasa. It may lead to action. If it, is, if it is evil, if it is dangerous, then the action also will be then dangerous. So we have to stop that. How to stop that? This is virus. Our mind, you know, we have to put the software we call antivirus. Okay. Antivirus. What is this antivirus? This knowledge about mm -hmm. God, the knowledge about ourselves, the nature of this world, the nature of Akhira. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, antivirus. When, when it comes, the wish first comes to our mind, the antivirus will scan. Virus detected, need further action. Delete, quarantine, ignore, move. Those, <laughs> those days. But now, no, antivirus is very smart. They don't ask any anymore. Remember, antivirus need to be updated. <laughs> so, so my dear brothers and sisters, this program is actually uh, about the call this updating antivirus. Antivirus. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, thank you, and, uh, Dr. Latif. It's very very helpful. Okay, uh, I can recall that uh, you mentioned about you know in Islam it clearly stated that uh, it's haram uh, you know in uh, in terms of uh, committing suicide and also things that uh, lead to suicide. So if those who have you know sometimes we have that thought without, you know, maybe in our, uh, like, we are not stable and then we, uh, the thought come to us. So, means that when you say that even when we have that societal thoughts, means that haram, so we have to do taubat, right? We yeah. have to, like, yeah. What, what do we need to do? 
this uh, this one is, is actually in the next question where <laughs> you asked now uh, already you know <laughs> this one do I, okay maybe i touch a little bit you know uh, yeah. of course uh, the, the the immediate as the immediate is istia istia the auzu billahi minash shaitanir rajim then you take you know if you are if you are okay no problem with you you are alone for example and then you have alhamdulillah then you take wudu you take wudu and pray to rakaat ustaz buat solat ustaz solat jenazah <laughs> no 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 solat jenazah solat tau taubat you know because because Allah said ma asabaka min sayyatin fa min nafsik those who things bad thing happen to you because of your mistake because of your weaknesses so we take wudu uh, ask Allah for the help you know because you know later when we talk about about help like for example miasa for example they give support but sometimes we call them they are busy for example they they have problem for example you know there are so many people you know even miasa also cannot of course cannot handle every everything so fine 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 somebody somebody i could i put quote and quote that will always be able will will to help and always be with you who are ma who are maakum aina ma kuntum he is with you wherever you are that is uh, allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa ta'ala okay okay thank you dr alhamdulillah okay so we got a very fruitful fruitful discussion here okay so we go to the next question so dr khadija oh panjang dah baru balik pada dr khadija okay so the the second question is about the factors that cause uh, a person to experience suicidal thought and self be, uh, self harm behavior apa yang menyebabkan dia orang ni terdorong untuk ada apa ni self talk uh, sorry self harm untuk membuat self harm ataupun untuk ada uh, suicidal thought ataupun try to uh, attempt suicide hmm. uh, thank you hi yes okay so um yes there's uh, a lot of uh, factors that can lead <coughs> people to have uh, suicidal thoughts and also self harm uh, i just want to touch about um having suicidal thoughts eh? um uh sometimes people have suicidal thoughts when even when they don't have uh, a a clinical um mental illness okay it means that um suicidal thoughts can be quite normal for every, uh, for all of us yeah so meaning sometimes when you have uh, a lot of problem yeah at one time uh, a lot of stress and suddenly you feel that uh, baik aku mati jelah kan mm-hmm. nak mati je okay but Um, actually, huh, if you look at this person, uh, they may not fulfill a criteria for clinical depression or anxiety disorders, yeah, because they are still able to function. But mm-hmm. the suicidal thoughts just come uh, impulsively uh, and just like um, it's a one-off thing. So I think in those situation, uh, like what uh, Dr. Abdul Latif mentioned just now, uh, uh, yes, you can use that technique where you go back to Allah. Uh, you ask for taubah eh? uh, you say astaghfirullah uh, and you um, uh, uh, focus yourself uh, on getting closer to allah and um, uh, have good relationship but then uh, there are this certain group of people who have clinical mental illness means uh, it, uh, they have all the symptoms yeah, including the suicidal thoughts and it it is, it is affecting their functioning so in this group of people they actually have uh, a mental illness a mental illness means uh, they have um, a neurobiological problem inside their brain yeah mm-hmm. so when they have this um, it's very difficult to say for these people uh, you do taubah uh, you ask uh, you ask for forgiveness from allah and everything will be fine it's very difficult because it's a, a medical problem Yeah, it's basically a medical problem. So, for example, like a person who has diabetes, would you say, okay, uh, the sugar is high, yeah? they have hyperglycemia, and then you say to them, oh, you can minta taubat from Allah, and say astaghfirullah, and then gula akan turun. No, it doesn't work like that. Yeah? So, they need to get the uh, medication in, yeah? so that it stabilizes uh, the, the sugar level. So, the same thing with people who are clinically uh, having mental disorder, 
yeah, uh, there is um, imbalance yeah, of the neurotransmitters inside the brain that's causing all the symptoms. So in this uh, case, yeah, I think they, what they need to understand is that the component, the biological component is very important and that they need to get the medication on board and all the other parts that we will discuss later on yeah, uh, in terms of treatment. Uh, but of yeah. course, yeah, the, I'm not saying that um, the spiritual aspect is not important, but what I'm saying is that there's these four domains which is very important yeah, in uh, causing the illness and also in helping a person to get better, which is the bio, psycho, social and spiritual. So it comes together. All right. So I just want to make that clear so that um, uh, there is a difference between having just normal suicidal thoughts and, uh, in, and having suicidal thoughts in a person who is clinically having a mental disorder. Okay, uh, just to get that clear first. All right. Um, moving on to the factors yeah, that cause a person to experience suicidal thoughts and also self-harm behavior. Um, let me just quote, yeah, uh, there has been research yeah, in Malaysia on risk factors for self-harm and also risk factors for suicide. What they found was that it's for self-harm, it's more in female yeah, uh, and younger people aged between 16 to 29 and also unmarried. Yeah? But for risk factors for suicide, yeah, uh, it's more common in male because when the male does it, they do it properly. Yeah? So uh, they, um, they use more little methods yeah? uh, and they completed the suicide. Uh, and the age is younger than 40 years. Yeah? And uh, research has shown as well that uh, the most common uh, group yeah, is in the Indian minority group. Uh, this is because uh, they use more little methods like ingesting pesticides. Okay? That is uh, from the Malaysian data. Other important factors um, that may contribute to a person having self-harm behavior and suicidal thoughts is being unemployed, yeah? coming from a low socioeconomic status. Yeah? Uh, definitely financial difficulties is a problem yeah? uh, and it leads to a lot of other issues, yeah? relationship issues, yeah? uh, problem um, about uh, yeah? um, sustaining their own livelihood. Yeah? So a lot of problems there, especially during this uh, pandemic time. Yeah? Uh, a lot of people have lost their jobs. Yeah? Uh, they have, um, they have, they are struggling uh, to get by yeah? every day. So we will see. Yeah, we will see more problems. Yeah, uh, contributed by this um, problems of financial difficulties, unemployment. Yeah, and um, the other factors includes uh, rural. Yeah, there's more uh, people who have problems in the rural area as compared to the urban population. Uh, and I think this is due to the access to uh, treatment as well. Yeah? Um, and then in terms of marital status, yeah, more in the single community and the divorce rather than the married. Yeah? And other factors include uh, having a mental illness uh, that is untreated, feeling of loneliness or hopelessness, yeah? having impulsivity, yeah? meaning when you have these thoughts, yeah, you immediately act on it. Yeah? So impulsivity is an issue as well. And if you have adversities in childhood, like trauma, abuse yeah, uh, during childhood, that is also a risk factor for self-harm behavior and uh, suicide. And then there are families who have family history of suicide. Yeah? Uh, their parents or um, relatives yeah, who have done suicide and sometimes um, yeah, uh, it can happen to the uh, younger generation as well. Okay. Um, other factors include uh, using substance or alcohol. Yeah? And another important one is interpersonal problems uh, like marital discord or family conflict that leads to poor social support and unstable relationship. Yeah? All these are factors yeah, that can lead to a person having self-harm behavior and also suicidal thoughts. So many factors. Yeah? Uh, and I just want to touch on the current yeah, situation where uh, based on my clinical experience, I'm seeing more youngsters coming in with self-harm behavior. Yeah? Um, sometimes yeah, uh, the person can come in yeah, from uh, maybe a religious school, yeah, wearing jubah, wearing tudung labo, but then um, she lifts her sleeves and you see all these cuts on her wrist. Okay, so it can be um, something that is uh, going on rampant yeah, among our youngsters. 
And I think this is also contributed to the uh, easy access to social media and also the internet because there are some uh, pro self-harm groups yeah, on the internet where they um, give ideas about how to self-harm and uh, promoting it as a way of uh, coping uh, and even as a lifestyle. Yeah? Uh, so uh, we need to be aware of this um, issue yeah? and because um, these are affecting our youngsters nowadays and they are going to be our uh, leaders yeah, for the next generation. So it's very important to look into this issue as well. And um, of course, yeah, the, um, the rate, yeah, rate of suicide and self-harm is also on the increase. Yeah? So that is alarming and I think uh, yeah, uh, it's good that uh, we are having this discussion and I hope that it's not just a discussion but it's also um, something that we can uh, come up uh, with a solution yeah, to, to improve the current situation. Okay, thank you, Kylie. Okay, okay. Uh, doctor, one more thing is I want to ask about, just now you said that, uh, because you said that there's, there are differences between uh, suicide common, uh, I mean like normal suicidal thought and self-harm and those who uh, have the suicidal thought and self-harm behavior because of they are clinically diagnosed with depression. So usually uh, those who are clinically diagnosed with depression, Okay, what are the factors? Adakah sama juga macam yang kata suicidal ataupun uh, suicidal thought ya, ataupun self-harm yang biasa ataupun they are actually because of ada biological factor ke yang menyebabkan diorang ada ni? Right, so the, the factors are similar but mm -hmm. of course if you have a family history yeah, of having mental disorder, yes it uh, adds on to the risk. Okay, if you have a family history of mental illness, that it adds on to the risk. Yeah, but uh, it means yeah. What I'm saying is that um, yes, other people yeah, uh, normal people who doesn't have a diagnosis of depression or anxiety or other mental illness like schizophrenia, they may have uh, on and off yeah, suicidal thoughts yeah, as well. So it's quite common. Mm -mm. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you, doctor. So we move to uh, our second panelist, Dr. Alizi Alias. Okay, uh, uh, kita nak tanya soalan ni. Uh, okay, so uh, self-harm and suicidal thought could be the symptoms that experienced by the employees. So how usually the organi organizations look on this matter? Means that how in our, in Malaysia lah, uh, in the con in context of Malaysia, Malaysia, uh, so how far organ uh, the organization actually play the role to help the employees with these uh, symptoms. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much, uh, Khairia. Uh, again, uh, let me start by informing you of a hadith and try to get some important lessons for employers, bosses, co-workers, and organizations in general. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the hadith, yeah? Jabir reported when the Prophet wasallam emigrated to Medina, at to file Ibn Amru, also emigrated along with a man from his people. We do not know his name, yeah? a man from his people. They strongly disliked the climate of Medina and the man became sick and suffered from anxiety. He took some of his arrowheads, cut the joints of his fingers and his hands bled out until he died. Atufail saw him in a dream, looking as if he were well but his hands were covered. Atufail said, how has your Lord treated you? How has, how has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala treated you? The man said, he has forgiven me due to my hijrah to his prophet. Atufail said, but why do I see your hands covered? The man said, I was told that we would not repair what you yourself have ruined. So Atufail told the story to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the Prophet said, and Prophet performed a dua, O oh Allah, and for his hands, forgive him. This is narrated by Muslim, hadith number 116. So what are the general lessons here on stigma, suicidal thoughts, and suicide here from this hadith? Number one, cover the eye of the person by not mentioning his name. We do not know who this sahabah is. 
Number mm -hmm. two, acknowledge the intense factor that leads to the mental illness, suicidal thoughts, and suicide. And hijrah was really, really very stressful events that can trigger mental illness to some, to some sahaba. Number three, be supportive to your suicidal friends. Ask, like to file did, ask how he or she is doing. Number four, mu'min who performs suicide is not considered as kafir or mushrik and he or she can enter Jannah. This is even said by Imam An-Nawawi. Number five, good deeds outweigh any sins. So always acknowledge that a mu'min accumulate lots of amal soleh too. This is sahabah, yeah, not a munafik, and his hijrah give him a lot of rewards. Number six, be a kind boss who try to help in any way you can, including dua. Even though the sahabah already entered Jannah, Prophet Wasallam still pray to Allah to give his hand, his hand back. So, based on lessons from this hadith, these are my suggestions on what organizations can do. Can do. I do not have data, like, like Haria asked how far Malaysian organization had performed these things, but at least I want to promote this for organization to practice. Number one, set up a clear policies and procedures to help employees who are at risk and in crisis. Have a clear SOP for responding to a suicide attempt or death at workplace. Number two, Always have mental health emergency contact information placed throughout the workplace. Example, Talian Kase, Briefenders, Talian Richu, Miasa, of course, Mercy Malaysia, among others. Yeah? And a lot of universities also have this helpline. Number three, education and training on mental health, suicide prevention, and also stigma reduction for employees. The do's and don'ts when interacting with persons who have suicidal thoughts. Number four, establish relationship with mental health professional in the local community. Example, mentari wings at public hospitals, psychiatric departments at university hospitals and private hospitals, and also local clinical psychology clinics. Make it formal. Yeah? Number five, creating a work environment that values its employees and promotes respect, open communication, a sense of belonging and emotional well-being and that encourages and that encourages people to seek help when they need it uh, and to support uh, to support each uh, each other the challenge is whether employer understand the importance of implementing all these that is our job to promote to advocate this do employers know that they are among their workers who are having mental illness even among high performers and do, they, do employers know that they need help in order to continue performing well? Are employers willing to spend a little bit on this suggestion so that they will save in long-term costs such as on medical fees, prolonged leaves, reduced productivity and loss of good workers? It's a cost. So that's why I support Tan Sri Lam, Li Lam Tai who suggested to the government to Revised Occupational and Safety Health Act OSHA 1994, especially Section 4C, to make it more friendly to the issue of mental illness among, among workers. So something for employers and bosses to think about. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Very, very detailed. Eh? And so many, so many things that the employers can do to actually to ensure the, the condition or the mental health of the employees. And then I would like to ask to Dr. Alizi, this is additional question. Okay. Do you think that those who are affected with mental health issues, I mean, like the workers that are affected uh, with mental health, mental health issues, uh, they can perform well in their uh, work? What definitely they can yeah because it is uh just just like a disabled person who can still perform at workplace but need some accommodation okay, for example blind, uh, rail, uh, for example a uh, deaf worker may need uh hearing aid or sign languages for example same thing with uh, workers with mental illness. Research has shown, for example, workers with uh, obsessive compulsive disorders or OCD can perform better in work that requires uh, uh, meticulousness because they are very, very perfect in the work. And research also have shown that people with uh, workers with depression uh, w uh, perform better when they, the, the job requires creativity because uh, people with depression can see things from different different perspectives. So please, yeah, please acknowledge your workers. They are good workers. They are like other people, normal people who get sick sometimes, for example, and need MC. 
So it is actually their rights to be treated fairly at the at the workplace. They definitely can perform well, and unless they become uh, awarded because of uh, a prolonged illness. Yeah. Okay. Thank okay. You. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Alizi. Okay. So uh, I think we can move to the uh, our next uh, panelist, uh, Madam Anita. Okay. Uh, it's about uh, how actually when you said just now you mentioned about uh, you know uh, the ustas and uh, you know how we actually help and guide to uh, the 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 person who uh, who suffer with the suicidal thought with uh, self harm behavior. Okay, mm -hmm. so what is the best way the society can can help or can can contribute uh, to those who are suffering with this illness? Uh, so. Uh, in uh, in the context of you know masyarakat to senior society how we we can contribute and how we can help them all right thank you um, very much sister kairia i think first and foremost is by seeking knowledge um, as we know knowledge changes everything it's transformative this is where um, you know better treatment will come in better help will come in um, support will come in better understanding empathy compassion kindness I think that we fear things that we don't understand so that would be first psychoeducation is so important uh, amongst family members um, friends caregivers to the person with the condition and I think this continues to be a big gap in Malaysia you know mental health literacy and education because published articles or videos or you know, mental health awareness talks and programs typically involve people that are affected in the mental health space um, that means mental health peers themselves or caregivers, families and friends, mental health professionals, you know, health workers, um, academicians that study mental health, you know, so it's very limited um, in terms of reach. And so what we have seen, although, you know, Miasa and our friends from, you know, the other mental health NGOs and other stakeholders that continue to do a lot of awareness works, it does change um, the perception of a person uh, when it comes to mental health uh, but and mental health um, condition or psychosocial disability but whether that translates into you know a change in behavior or action um, that is one of the things that remains to be seen and I think the other most important thing other than seeking knowledge is not to be quick to judge um, you know as I mentioned earlier we don't necessarily have interacted with a person with the condition um, but you know, we are quick to judge, label, advice. Um, and I think uh, we have to come from, you know, a mindset of we don't know everything. Um, there are better ways to do things, of course, and come from a place of um, empathy and compassion and kindness because uh, truth be told, everyone struggles different kinds. Some people are better at keeping it, um, at hiding it, and um, some people, you know, share it across. Uh, and so I think empowering the community, making them understand that a suicide is everyone's business, that mental health, um, you know, is everyone is susceptible to mental health, even if you're a psychiatrist, even if you're a dean of a university, even if you are, you know, uh, an ustaz, um, even if you are a spiritual healer, you know, uh, no one you know, can run away from it if, uh, because it's kun faya kun at the end of the day. So if enough factors are available, you know, like Dr. Khadija was saying, you know, a mental health condition, I think what is important for everyone to understand is, is multifactorial. You know, if enough factors exist, you know, anyone can get it. Um, and that is why, you know, like I said, it's very complex. You know, suicide is complex. Uh, there's a lot of variables uh, and mental health condition, mental health, you know, there's a continuum, there's a spectrum. So there's a lot of learning that needs to come with it. You know, um, I know everyone um, always wants a short answer, a simple answer, a direct answer to it, but uh, there isn't one, you know, there's, there's a lot of things um, that needs to be understood and studied, you know. Um, and like I said, we, we have arrived to a very strange situation uh, in today's world where, you know, 800,000 people die every single year and we still don't understand it enough. And, um, you know, again, like Dr. Khadija was saying, there's, you know, the four components. And, you know, even for me personally, spirituality played a big component in my, um, you know, recovery journey. And I feel it should be uh, for a lot of people, but 
it is not enough. It has to be the approach to recovery must be a holistic approach. You know, you can't be, for example, I can give you a very good example, taking medication, but not doing anything else, not taking care of your sleep, not eating well, you know, self-care, tak ada, um, you know, not exercising, you know, all these things. So there's, you know, a big, um, a long process to it. There's, you know, a lot of things that needs to be done. Then only can recovery come into the picture. So all in all, you know, everyone has a role to play. And I feel that if all of us play our roles well, um, then, you know, we, we can beat this. And I think with the whole pandemic of COVID-19, this is a big opportunity where we can now talk about mental health in a big way because it has impacted the mental health of many people, if not, you know, most. And some people, you know, can, you know, beat it and become normal, but again, functioning individuals. And for some people, it becomes a mental health condition, uh, which is a test in itself. And I think what is important for all of us to, to realize, uh, especially, you know, my peers out there that are struggling is that, um, you know, this is a test of patience. It a te is a test of faith. There's a lot of hikmah uh, behind the condition. And I feel if I can share the greatest gift, uh, alhamdulillah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, granted me with was uh, the gift of empathy. Um, throughout my struggles with the condition and although empathy is something that can be learned but nothing beats you know um, acquiring empathy through struggling um, so that is the bittersweet of struggles I feel um, so I think yeah. uh, if you want to talk about the role of community um, there's many actually sister Kyria uh, we don't have yeah. time to go through all of it uh, but that is some of the things that I can share knowledge uh, being first and foremost um, key here yeah, okay. So, if I can recall, it's, uh, the role of community is the first uh, mentioned by, uh, by Madam Anita is um, we have to seek knowledge, okay, and then, of course, not to be quick to judge, okay. So, we have to understand, as you said, that suicide is complex, okay. Kita tak berada dekat situ, tak berada dalam keadaan orang tu. So, we never know what the person experienced. Okay, thank you. Madam Anita, so we go to uh, Dr. Latif, okay. So the, uh, 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 actually, we, we, we're running out of time, but I think I can combine these two questions to Dr. Latif, okay. Uh, how actually we explain the role of religion uh, in, in helping a person to cope with mental illness? And then uh, what is your comment in terms of uh, when people say that a, relig a religious person with good practice of, practice of worship is also at risk to have suicidal thought and committing self-harm behavior? So yeah, these two questions, maybe Dr. Latif can answer. Okay, thank you very much. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala Sayyidina Muhammad. <clears throat> Before I go to uh, answer the question, <clears throat> I thank you uh, very much for Dr. Khadija for uh, clarification to make that the audience not uh, not understanding in a simplistic way. Meaning that maybe, maybe in terms of uh, 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 feeling, emotion, maybe in, in this situation, the psychotherapists, they know better. They know better. Mm -hmm. But please, you know, uh, you know, uh, is there is is there any any situation any moment that you know the level of consciousness and the level of rationality of the the patient that we can instill this at uh, a uh, god awareness god awareness is very important we like for example dr anita uh, uh, madam anita said you know maybe it is for her it is a gift we we don't wait for the for the gift we need to put certain effort let's say for example if the the ther the psychotherapist for example they know that uh, this uh, uh, this patient, you know, at this uh, level of rationality, level, level of consciousness can be instilled uh, the emotions of this uh, uh, God aware awareness. Because what? Because, you know, only this will remain with the patient throughout uh, uh, his life when he is uh, alone, beside, for example, the support by the medic, med, medicine and so, and so on. Uh, although oh. Dr. Khadija said that, you know, like, for example, diabetic, diabetic, oh. of course, diabetic, for example, it is physical. <laughs> It is physical uh, in nature, and the treatment also physical. But you know, but Allah said, "Wama yatakilla yajallahu makhraja." Those who fear Allah, close to Allah, we will open for them their way of 
uh, what they call it, solu- solution. You know, at least, at least Allah guide them to go to the right doctors and doctor will give the right medicines. These are all planned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. Now, you know, uh, it, 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 it complements. It, complement. it shouldn't be, for example, oh, uh, we have to leave this, we have to do this. No, both two should complement each, uh, each other. And Allah said in Surah Al-Tala, verse and two ayah, وَمَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهِ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِ يُسْرَى Those who fear Allah, Allah make your thing easy. Number one, Allah open the door for solutions. And number two, Allah will make your thing easy. Of course, you must, you, we must have knowledge. Like Madam Anita said, we must have knowledge about God. Who is God? Number two, about Sunnatullah. How the system runs. And the, number three is Shari'atu, Shari'atullah. Okay, uh, back to the question uh, this, uh, by uh, Madam Khairiyah. So, uh, how? What is the solution from uh, from is Islam? Okay, you know we must uh, understand. Uh, you know uh, what is the, what is the re- religion? Religion is rahmatan lil alamin, and we are makhlu Allah. We are the creation of Allah subhanahu wa taala, and Allah knows best. You know, Allah give the uh, the illness. Allah also prepared for the what they call the medica- medication. You know, I like to give an, an, an analogy, you know, let's say, for example, we are, we want to go through a jungle. I want to go through a jungle. This is a big jungle, dangerous jungle, you know, so many tests in the jungle. Okay, there are two ways. There are two ways. Number one, number one, you know, there is a guardian, uh, uh, you know, at the door of the jungle. And then this guardian say, you know, I know about this jungle. You follow this, the rule and module that I prepare, you know. And then when you, you enter, you follow. I will guide you. I will guide you. Don't worry. So, but some people, they say, no, I don't want to listen to you. I want to study myself. I want to learn myself. I want to experiment myself. You see what will happen? These two people, you know, whether they, they submit to the, guide, to the guardian of the jungle or they, they just simply based on their mind and, re- and reason. Which one will go through past this jungle safely? Of course, those who submit and surrender to the owner of the guy, of the guidance, you know. This is a, a very simple analogy because time does not uh, let me explain in, de- in detail. I hope that that analogy will, will uh, you know, uh, enlighten, uh, you know, how we should submit, you know, get close uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another thing is that, uh, this is number one about seeking no? knowledge. Number two is about sabar and, and salat. Uh, was ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sta'inu bis sabri was salah this is mentioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah knows best sabar you know sometimes people say oh, why sabar always sabar you know so we have to explain to them sabar sabar of course when you are in trouble you know the best mechanism eh, to, to make you strong is sabar of course this sabar the level of sabar the degree of sabar is given by religion is given by I, iman but another another angle of sabar is sabar on ni'mah that is shukur you know when dr alizi said at the very beginning we have we have to take out the passion from discomfort you know when they come their mind is so narrowed their, their mind is so negative how to take out this passion from discomfort that is by by instilling in them the feeling of shukur how that is by telling them about the ni'mah, the ni'mah. Highlight to them about the ni'mah they have uh, compared to the tribulation they face. Of course, in our life, mm, there are a lot of ni'mah compared to musi- musibah. But we are good in delaying. When we are sad, we delay all the reasons that to make us ha- happy. That's another part of sabah, shukur. This is the most effective way to take out the, the passion uh, from discom- discomfort, so that they can think rationally. The level of consciousness is, is incre- increasing. And then Salat. I saw one, you know, I saw one, one student, you know, in one program, they are having, pro- she is having problem asking co- questions, social pho- phobia. And then when he sit down, the friends, you know, pam- comfort him. I, I, you know, I said to the sister, sister, you are lucky because you have uh, uh, friends that, always be with you and comfort you but you must be rational you know because what because this friend will not always be with you she has his own her own to what I call this duty and responsibility find some quote unquote find somebody that never leave you always with you who 
Of course Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how to communicate with Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala? How to be close with Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala? The best way is so salat. That's why the Quran says wasta'inu bi sabri was salah. Of course You know, when somebody comes to your, your office, you don't simply say, go and perform so, salat. At least, you know, when when their level of consciousness and rationality is there, let's say, for example, instill in them, you know, the, this uh, necessary no, knowledge. Right? The necessary knowledge. And then based on my my studies, you know, consulting the expert among the solution also, this is very important. That is, suhbatu salihin. You must socialize with the good people. Like for example, this uh, Miasa, for example, always contact them, asking them, for example, asking advice for from them. That's solid. So they will they will advise you. They will if they see something wrong with you, they will they will correct you. For example, this is very important. So have to solve solihin. That's a uh, one of the solu solution. And the other solution is that uh, occupy your mind. You must you know because when your mind is empty. You know, the wish first will come from shay- shaitan. Shaitan will fulfill your mind with negative, what they call things, penetration, for example, this uh, waswa, waswasa. So we have to occupy ourselves with zikru, zikrullah, eh, zikrullah. And also, uh, this is very important also, besides occupying your mind with zikrullah, occupying also yourself with activi- activity. This is like, for example, volunteer, volunteerism. Khairukum, the Prophet said, Anfa'ukum din nas, the best of you are those who, who are the best to the, pe- the people. So these are the, the solution that, uh, uh, that you know, uh, to, to what they call this, to protect ourselves from this, what they call this, these issues. Uh, the, regarding the last question, I want to simplify it. Uh, this is, you know, uh, somehow like a uh, uh, misunderstanding, you know, those who are good, uh, what they call it, worship, worshippers, are they Are they free from this illness? Okay. You know, I want to tell you, you know, actually, those who are the earliest, the earliest that will be punished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are those the best in, in what they call this, in war worshippers. Those who are, those the first that will be uh, hisab by Allah. And those who are, those the best, those the first that can be punished by Allah, those are the best in red. In religion, number one, those shahid, shahid, you know, fighting for the way of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, die as a shahid, and Allah said, "You are liar." Then he is being thrown into the hell. Alim, the second one, alim, teacher, kari ul Quran, and then you are liar. And this two, also, this the, the second one also will be thrown into the hell, and the third one, those who give a lot of infa and sadaka, and Allah said, "You are liar." And they are also being thrown into the into the hell. Nobody is safe. Nobody is safe. This is the promise of the shaitan, the promise of the devil. You know, I will, I will. What they call this? Uh, make all your servants deviated from you, deviated from you. This is my promise. Prolong my life. And Allah granted this permission, except those mukhlasin. Who are those mukhlasin? Those who are very close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, working very hard to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah is the most listening. Allah is the most merciful. Allah knows all those in the heart uh, of his, uh, his servant. Get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, inshallah. That's my brief uh, answers to your quest question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. Welcome. So it's very meaningful as the last one. Sometimes we forget that, you know, we tend to look at the outward behavior without look at the, you know, just now you mentioned about mukhlisin, you know, ikhlas, keikhlasan kita untuk melakukan sesuatu. Okay. So, uh, and then uh, the other things that I can recall is about how we want to, uh, uh, the religion can help us uh, through seeking knowledge, Uh, sabar and solat, socialize with good people, occupy our mind, especially with zikrullah, and also occupy ourselves with uh, the activities. Okay, uh, we come to the end, and I have my last questions to all the panelists, okay? So, uh, like, uh, to Dr. Khadija, okay, um, 
in the simple and short, uh, what are actually the best treatment, okay, for those who experience these symptoms and your last word and wisdom words, wisdom words to the audience. Okay, thank you, Khairia. Um, so my advice would be, uh, if you have uh, uh, symptoms uh, or emotional distress, it's good to seek treatment early. Yeah, uh, get assessment. Yeah, because sometimes when you come early, it's only just probably counseling, talking, learning about coping. Yeah, and and just reminders. Yeah, or problem solving. Uh, but uh, if you delay it, sometimes yeah, um, the illness will become uh, worse. Yeah. And um, like I said before, uh, in uh, mental illness is multifactorial. So uh, and so is the treatment. Yeah? So when we talk about treatment, we want to give holistic approach uh, treatment, which includes the bio, psycho, social, and spiritual approach. Yeah, bio means the medication part. Yeah, psychological is uh, looking into how you see things about yourself, about the other people, your coping strategies, uh, problem solving, uh, and other things. So uh, in this um, uh, in this domain, yeah, when you need a psychological approach, um, it's good yeah, if you can get psychotherapy. But unfortunately, the reality is we don't have enough clinical psychologists. Yeah? Based on my experience, uh, when I'm um, treating my patients in my private clinic, it's easier for me to uh, give the um, holistic approach. Yeah? But in a government setting, yeah, uh, it's very, the time is very limited. And it's very difficult for us to deliver this holistic approach. So um, I encourage yeah, if there are psychologists out there, yeah, it's good yeah, uh, uh, to have more psychologists on board yeah, so that we can have a more holistic approach. And then the social part, yeah, Dr. Alizi mentioned about yeah, um, the um, upper employers yeah, having to give support yeah, to the employees and all. I think that is very important because sometimes yeah, uh, I see patients, yeah, we, we have treated the symptoms yeah uh, they are well they are ready to go back to work but they cannot get yes. the work yeah so when that happens yeah they cannot uh, be employed yeah? so it um it disrupts their self-confidence and it makes them more depressed yeah they have financial difficulties and uh, they spiral down yeah so they continue to have uh, the mental illness uh, again yeah so uh, that is very important as well uh, apart from uh, the workplace issues, yeah, uh, in terms of uh, family issues, yeah, it's good as well to have like um, family therapy sessions, yeah, um, uh, to gain the the a good social support, yeah, to get better. Because sometimes when you want to get better, it's very difficult if you're trying to do it alone. Yeah, so it's good to have people around you, and of course spiritual. Yeah, it's very important. Yeah, I agree with Dr. Latif. It's very important. Yeah, you always have to go back there because um, at the end of the day, all, uh, all the things that we're doing are efforts. Yeah? Uh, but Allah is the one who will grant the uh, healing. Yeah? So you need to go back to, uh, to Allah. But I think the timing, yeah? uh, the timing and also the rapport is very important. Yeah? Um, for myself, uh, I wouldn't go straight into talking about religion, about spiritual aspect with patients. But I will go with them uh, regarding the biological, psychological, social. And then when they are more comfortable, I will go into the spiritual part. Yeah? I, had, I have had one uh, patient yeah, because of uh, his issues. Yeah? He becomes uh, very far from God until he thinks that he's an atheist. Yeah? But I didn't touch on the spiritual aspect until I touched all the biopsychosocial first. Yeah, and then um, as soon as all those um, as are settled, yeah, then it's easier for me to discuss with him about the uh, spiritual uh, part. And um, uh, Alhamdulillah, huh? um, he starts praying again. Yeah, he has uh, strong belief in Allah, yeah? and it definitely yeah, improves the uh, overall um, improvement, yeah, uh, or wellness in him. Okay, so. Uh, lastly, yeah, uh, I just want to say that um, again, yeah, I need. I think it is very important for everyone to remember that mental illness, yeah, is just like any other illnesses, yeah. So if you have it, you should not be ashamed to get it treated, yeah. So if your family or friend has it, advise them and support them to get treatment, yeah. If you're an employer, uh, support your employees or worker to get treatment. Uh, the earlier it's treated, I think the better the outcome is. So if everybody plays our part, yeah, inshallah we will 
uh, be able to break the stigma uh, and we'll, we'll see more improvement, inshallah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Okay. So we go to the second panelist, Dr. Alizi. Okay. Your last word or wisdom word. And then uh, maybe you can give some hadith or yeah, you can quote hadith you want to give and share with us. Okay. Uh, last word of wisdom. Yeah. Maybe I can I can talk about, I want to focus on the stigma. Yeah? First, first of all, I want to go back to the themes of uh, this IUM program. Uh, most chronic illnesses are beyond our control. Not just physical illness, but also mental illness. These are chronic illnesses, invisible illness. This is where ruhsah or facilitation or exception comes into the picture. Always remember this. They, they have exception. Yeah? I noticed somebody say it's difficult to be khushu in salat. It's yeah, okay. Yeah. Depends on your capacity. And if you are too tired, to, uh, you, you, uh, you, you oversleep, for example, it's okay because the time of Zuhur or Asad is very long. You can mm -hmm. delay it, but make sure you come salat. And if you, if you oversleep, it's not, it's not sinful. Yeah, Allah is very merciful. Prophet Muhammad is very, very merciful. So there are rukhsa here. Mm -hmm. So we, as, as their friends, as their colleagues, should help uh, them to still perform excellently within their capacities either in their personal ibadah and even when performing work because work also is part of ibadah okay. and even people without mental illness but facing temporary worries or temporary sadness we should give we should not give stigmatic statements to them okay so how to break the stigma i want you to remember these two caves you know caves ghoul like batu caves okay. yeah okay. two caves First, caves of Hira and then caves of Thur. Mm -hmm. uh, number one, caves of Hira. Study how non-stigmatizing Khadijah binti Khuwailid radiyallahu anha was when communicating with Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi when he is very worried after coming back from the cave of Hira. Number two, cave of Thur. Uh, study back how non-stigmatizing Abu Bakar as-Siddiq was when Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was very worried about the enemies who were outside of the caves about to capture them, so if you can break your stigma towards our own beloved, ideal Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you can break stigma towards people with mental illness, including those with suicidal thoughts. So that's all for me. Thank you very much. Back to Hariya. Okay, thank you, Doctor. Very, very meaningful and very, very fruitful sharing from you. Thank you, Doctor. Okay, so we go to uh, Madam Anita. Your last word. To the uh, thank you. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Sister Karian. Thank you very much, everyone, uh, for tuning in. I uh, truly hope it was beneficial, um, positive um, takeaways, inshallah. Um, I just want to say, as usual, um, being Miyasa, being a person with a condition as well, is providing a message of hope to those of you that are struggling out there. Please know that you can recover um, from the condition. Uh, please know that um, their treatments are available. There's help, there's support. Um, you know, even if you find that you don't have that support, really mental health NGOs on the ground. You know, we have uh, mental health professionals that can help you. Um, we have peer support, um, non-medical alternatives are available. And normalizing the discussion, talking about it, taking away the shame um, from the condition is very important so that finding people that are struggling um, will be able to get the help um, the treatment and support that they need. That they need, and I think um, this is very important, especially coming to the discussion of you know, thoughts, ideation, behaviors, and also self harming. And um, as usual, when we talk about topics um, as hard or challenging as this, um, it's very important to end with you know helplines and where people can access help. Um, so I would like to um, encourage all of you. If you're going through any mental health struggles, if you have not done any mental health assessment, please do so. You can do it at any health clinics around Malaysia. If you are in crisis, in emergency need of help, you can proceed to the nearest hospital, to the emergency department. You can contact any mental health NGOs on the ground um, to do a mental health assessment and for um, any kind of intervention. You can follow Miasa Malaysia. 
uh, it's miasa.malaysia on any social media platform. Um, so I think that is it from uh, my side. Um, thank you very much, uh, everyone. And I apologize for any shortcomings on my side. Uh, and this with Wabilai Taufiq Wa Hidayah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Anita. Okay, uh, so don't forget, you know, uh, what Madam Anita mentioned. Okay, so seek help. Okay, uh, you can get help not only through the health clinic that we have, uh, through the hospital, but also we, you can reach uh, the NGO as well. Okay, uh, the last but not least, uh, Dr. Latif, your simple, short and sweet um, wisdom or last word. Okay, sorry. If we need, uh, if we need to be strong, be with Allah. Allah is the strongest. If we feel that we are uh, what they call this uh, fakir, be with the rich. Allah is the most rich. If we feel that we are not not honored, be with the most honored. Al Karim. Allah is Al Karim. You know, whatever, be with Allah. Allah will never leave you. Allah will never do zalim to you. Allah is the most merciful. If you have Allah, you have everything. But if you have everything, but you don't have Allah, actually you have nothing. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Very meaningful. Thank you. Thank you to everybody. Thank you to all the panelists. Very, very fruitful sharing discussion. I hope that it will give benefit to everybody, to the audiences. Okay, tak, tak sempat nak bagi, nak dapatkan soalan daripada the audiences. I hope that uh, uh, Menteri Pupila is enough uh, and uh, membantu all the audience.